angels say it three, three times. It's page 199. King of kings and Lord of lords. Do you need it? All right. King of kings and Lord of lords. Glory. Thank you. 
Thank you. 
We're going to take a little side break. Um, today is someone's birthday. Uh, Teresa, we are just so excited that you're part of us as a family. And, and Victoria has created a beautiful birthday card for you. But before we do, let's sing happy birthday. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday, dear Teresa. Happy birthday to you. And then Thank you. And when we, I was in Sunday school as a little girl, there was a second verse that said, Happy birthday to you. Only one will not do. Born again means salvation. And then you'll have two. So, yeah, I just hope, and I know she's had two, but it's really just a fun time. Uh, Pray and praise, we need to keep Miss Bonnie in our prayers. Um, she called us up, and I missed the phone, so she talked to Miss Elaine. So, Miss Elaine, it's going to come out of your mouth for Miss Bonnie. Well, she said that they had another doctor. The other doctor uh, told, and they really got a good doctor because this guy, Bonnie, said that he walked up to her brother-in-law and sat, I mean, you're the brother-in-law, <laughs> and sat down and says, I know you've had a stroke. I know you can't talk, but I know you can hear. And this is what I'm going to do for you. And he explained the new meds that I was going to be on. And and Bonnie said that already ready, he's passing more urine, a whole lot more than what he was before. So his body is getting rid of that poison. But isn't that something to have a doctor when the wife and the sister-in-law was in the room with with the man? To come and sit down right before the man and talk to him instead of the other babies. And so. Bonnie has said that he's actually doing a turnaround, just an attitude and all of that. So I know we've been praying for her to be able to stand. So keep praying, keep praying. Anybody else? I gotta thank the Lord for the birds and the bees and the flowers and the trees. Absolutely, absolutely. <laughs> Be also thinking too of um, for Bible camp right now. We only have four kids going, um, and one who really wanted to go um, is unable to go. So her heart's really broken. Um, but we said next year, next year. So I'll be praying for that. Anything else? All right, let's go before the Savior. Heavenly Father, I just come before you and I thank you so much for your love. And I thank you for just the way you're working in us. Um, I thank you for the good news from the doctor for Bonnie. And I also thank you, too, for the good news for uh, Vaughn and Betsy. And, um, Vaughn's in rehab, and I just really pray that um, you'll bring her back, bring him back to Betsy. And I just know how hard it's been. Father, I just also thank you, too, for our volunteer fire department and EMTs and how they've helped out. And Lord, you are just so gracious. You are so kind. You are so loving. And, and often we forget to thank you for the simple things that we see. I continue to pray, too, for our teens and, and our young youth. And just bring kids back to church. Bring families back to church. Father, there's just so many out there that say they, they know you but they're missing the fellowship part. And I just thank you for who you are. Thank you for the way you work in our lives. In Jesus' most precious name, amen. amen. Also, I want to make a quick announcement. Um, next Sunday is um, Andrews and Wanda's Living Hope Fellowship. If you'd like to know more, talk to Andy before he leaves today, uh, or if you need directions of where the house is. Also, too, the Senior Center is reopening. Uh, tomorrow, so food is being served and ready to eat. And uh, as many of you know, we had to close down 
because we lost a freezer, and then we lost air conditioning, and then we lost the refrigerator. But the refrigerator and the air conditioner are both back on, um, so that's a good thing, and we're in the process of getting the refrigerator or the freezer working out. So, yes, ma'am. You should also say what happened at the high school. Oh, well, we found our freezer had broken on Monday when we went to um, work, or actually when our cook went to work. And um, on Thursday, I was calling up the high school. Actually, I called the, um, Joy is her name. Called Joy and asked her if she had any freezer space that we could put some stuff in. And she said, no, we don't because our freezer went out sometime this past week. So, and the, so anyway, we had freezer, freezer, air conditioning, refrigerator, all go out on the same grid, but Valley Electric says there was no power surge, so who knows what caused that. So, but just be praying for those things to fall back into place, and I just wanted everybody to know, food is being served at the center, and it's not just open for old people. Anybody can come and enjoy lunch. So, at this time, I have a children's moment to finish. <laughs> All right. Okay, yeah, you're good. Pull it back. We are his workmanship, right? Creating Christ Jesus. Well, you know what? Those of you who saw last week, I need to do it a little bit different. But remember how we had things we hated to do? And if I look, I got my two cups. Can I go through the paper yet? No, I can't. So, you know, if we do not know Jesus as our personal Savior, there's no way we can get through. So, I know Jesus, but can I get through yet? Oh, I can't get through yet. All right. So, we have things we just don't like to do, don't we? We have things we don't like to do. And last week, we listed out those things. And the Bible says we are God's workmanship. And he's going to do what? He's helping us, right? So, if I know Jesus as my Savior, I can know he's going to help me through it, right? What is he going to do? He's going to help me through those hard times. Sometimes... It makes, it's like God just doesn't work fast enough. You ever had that feeling? I have. Sometimes, but you know what? God's going to help us through it. And what is he going to do? He's going to help us through it. He's going to do what? Help us through it. Are you ready? Help us through it. You ready? Ready. Can you go through it now? Can you go through it? Oh, back up. Oh, there. There you go. Can you walk through it? Yeah. Are you going to walk through it? Who's, who's going to walk through it? Me. All right, Anola. Ready? Come on. Come here. We're going to walk it through. <laughs> How about if we put it over your head? Yeah. Can we go through that way? Can you go through? And who's protecting you the whole time you're going through? God is protecting you. Okay. Anola's walk through it. William, can you walk through it? Or should we over the head? Can you go through it? Look at that. Look at that. Who's going to help you? Jesus. Jesus is going to help us through our problems. How about you, Julius? Ready? All right. Can you, oh, and he squishes even tighter. <laughs> Squiggle it down. Can you walk through? So hard time. God helps us through hard times. No matter how hard, God can help us through. Amen. So we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus to do bad or to do good? To do good. To do good. Thank you so much. Good job, guys. Good job. And sometimes we forget that God is the one who brings it forward to us. Our next song, please. There it is. Is one day when heaven was filled with his praises. And if you'd like to stand, please do. It's on page 294, if you want to use the hint. Thank you. 
I like that music. <laughs> yes. Good hit. Well, we're going to start um, First Corinthians four. Well, we're going to do the whole the whole thing, Lord willing. Um, but we're actually going to start in at the end of three because it kind of is the chapter change in the middle of the talk. Let's pray first. Heavenly Father, I thank you for this day and that it's a little bit cooler than it has been. And um, there's some clouds. And it's raining all around the not <laughs> and um, but they but our weather people have predicted that it's going to rain maybe possibly and we ask that you would if it's in your will that you would give us some rain um, right here in town. And I thank you for this opportunity to come and worship you and to sing these songs and fellowship with other believers. And I ask that your Holy Spirit would instruct people through your word with an understanding of, of your word. And in Jesus' name we pray, amen. amen. So starting in right away in verse chapter 3, verse 21, um, I, I'm having a hard time understanding Corinthians. Does anybody else? Um, even I, I've been looking up in different. Uh, I haven't just been using J. Vernon McGee, who's my my fallback guy, you know. But on some of these verses, um, I, I don't really understand. Well, I'll just read First uh, Corinthians four one. Let us so con let let me read it correctly. <laughs> let a man so consider us as servants of Christ and stewards of the mysteries of God. Um, there's, it seems like he might be saying let men consider us to be servants of Christ and stewards of the mysteries of God, in which case there is a big break between 3 and 4. But he may be talking about, um, and you know, I mean, a lot of the commentaries all say the same thing, but it just doesn't kind of feel right to me. And not, not that I think that I'm, I'm more right than them, but it may be that Paul is saying, this. First Corinthians 3 21 says, Therefore let no one boast in men. For all things are yours, whether Paul or Apollos or Cephas, or the world, or life, or death, or things present or things to come, all are yours, and you are Christ's, and Christ is God's. Let a man so consider us as servants of Christ and stewards of the mysteries of God. So I'm not sure exactly which way it is. It, it doesn't make a huge difference. He's either saying, um, that we're all gods, or he's saying not not that we are gods. I don't want to. There's another church here in town that can say that but that we belong to God, or um, that he's saying let to, to let people think of um, the apostles as servants of Christ and stewards of the mystery of God. In the I think the point is the same that we're not supposed to be following people. We're supposed to be following God. It's just, it's been, I've been having kind of a hard time getting the exact, you know, like the, the flow of it down. Mysteries, uh, you know, we've said repeatedly um, here, when Paul refers to mysteries in this book, he's talking about things that were formerly hidden and are now revealed. So the gospel is a mystery, not because we don't know the ending of it, but because we do. Verse 2, moreover, it is required in stewards that one be found faithful. He's referring, of course, to himself. He just said, let people consider us as servants of Christ and stewards of the mystery of God. But also, I think, I think it's clear that all of us are stewards of the mystery, mysteries of God, stewards of the gospel. But it also holds true in many things. And a lot of times, whenever I think in the Bible we talk about stewardship, everyone immediately thinks of money. And that's not all bad, because God either gives us a job and that gives us money, or sometimes he gives us a government that gives us lots of money to keep us from noticing the trillions of dollars that they're spending on their own projects. <laughs> kind of like, look, you've got this thousand dollars, and I'm going to go spend a trillion over here. Um, but whatever the case may be, that money came from God, and we don't own anything really as Christians. Um, and what we do with that money will be judged. And Matthew 25, it's interesting how when I was studying Romans, I kept going to Corinthians. It kept reminding me of things in Corinthians and 20 Corinthians. And now that I'm in Corinthians, if you notice, we've been referring to Matthew a lot. 
a lot of it being Matthew 6, which I think we'll study a little bit later. But now in Matthew 25, uh, 14 through 28 is the parable of the talents. This isn't to be confused with the parable of the steward, who is a whole different story, and that's in uh, that one was in Luke. And when I typed in my my search engine, I was like, Par "Oh, stewardship. Okay, parable about stewardship," and it brought up that, and it's a completely different story. But this is the one that we usually use. You've heard of this before, I'm sure. Other people talking about. Uh, stewardship and, and uh, money usage and Jesus is talking and he says for the kingdom of heaven is like and actually he didn't say I, I don't the, if you look in, mo in this is from the uh, New King James it doesn't actually say the kingdom of heaven is it says for like a man traveling to a far country in context it looks like it's saying the kingdom of heaven is like and so the people that translated the Bible added that but um, I, I, I notice more and more of these italics and the things that were put in to make the translation easier to understand and wonder sometimes, I hope that we got it right, you know? And again, it wouldn't matter hugely because it says, for, like a man traveling to a far country, called his own servants and delivered his goods to them. And to one he gave five talents, to another two, and to another one to each according to his own ability, and immediately he went on a journey. Then he who had received the five talents went and traded with them and made another five talents. And likewise, he who had, re who had received two talents, two more also. But he who had received one went and dug in the ground and hid his Lord's money. After a long time, the Lord of those servants came and settled accounts with him. So he who had received five talents came and brought five other talents, saying, Lord, you delivered to me five talents. Look, I have gained five more talents besides them. His Lord said to him, Well done, good and faithful servant. You are faithful over a few things. I will make you ruler over many things. Enter into the joy of your Lord. He also, who had received two talents, came and said, Lord, you delivered to me two talents. Look, I have gained two, talents, two more talents besides them. His Lord said to him, Well done, good and faithful servant. You have been faithful over a few things. I will make you ruler over many things. Enter into the joy of your Lord. Then he who had received the one talent came and said, Lord, I knew you to be a hard man, reaping where you have not sown, and gathering where you have not scattered seed. And I was afraid, and went and hid your talent in the ground. Look, there you have what is yours. But the Lord answered him and said to him, the Lord answered and said to him, You wicked and lazy servant, you knew that I reap where I have not sown, and gather where I have not scattered seed. So you ought to have deposited my money with the bankers, and at my coming I would have received back my own with interest. So take the talent from him and give it to him who has ten talents. For to everyone who has, more will be given, and he will have abundance. But from him who does not have, even what he has will be taken away. And cast the unprofitable servant into the outer darkness. There will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. So... In a lot of these um, parables, I think the landowner or the, the judge in them is representative of Jesus or God the Father. And in Luke 6, what was, what's interesting about it, um, or 16, I'm sorry, Luke 16, is the parable of the steward. And the key to it is that the, the rich man, the certain rich man in it, is not... God. It's a, it's a um, interesting parable because it uses a, a, a negative example, a kind of an example of how the world works and, and how we're supposed to use our, our money and talents. And I don't mean talents like money, but like the things that God gives us. God also gives us time, which we kind of spend much like money. And then, of course, in this particular instance, I think Paul is talking about God gave us the gospel. And we have knowledge of the mystery of the gospel, and what we do with that will also be judged. Verse 3, but with me it is a very small thing that I should be judged by you or by a human court. In fact, I do not even judge myself. For I know of nothing against myself, yet I am not justified by this, but he who judges me is the Lord. And of course, I think the easiest way to see this is that Paul is saying that he doesn't think 
there's a possibility that the Corinthians were talking bad about him and saying that he had done something. Um, but in the context here, it's almost like he's saying that he's done his best to share the gospel, that he's never let an opportunity go to share the gospel. And that's something I wish I could say, but I can't. Verse 5, Therefore judge nothing before the time until the Lord comes, who will both bring to light the hidden things of darkness and reveal the counsels of the hearts. Then each one's praise will come from God. 1 Corinthians talks a lot about judgment, and it's interesting because this book is written to Christians, it's written to the Corinthian church. And he never, that I know of, calls their salvation into question, except in the way that all, of, all books in the Bible tend to, which is if there's no sign that you're a believer, then it might be worth you questioning it. But he's writing it to the believers, and so the judgment that he talks about here and later in the book is how we lived our lives and what our rewards will be for what we've done with the things that God gave us. And I don't think that it's selfish. It, it kind of immediately sounds like I'm, I'm doing this because I want to get a present from God when I see him. And that's absolutely why I'm doing it. And I don't think that that is selfish. And I think that it's good to look at what Jesus said in Matthew 6. And here we are back in Matthew 6, verse 1. Take heed that, that you do not do your charitable deeds before men to be seen by them. Otherwise, you have no reward from your Father in heaven. Therefore, when you do a charitable deed, do not sound a trumpet before you, as the hypocrites do in the synagogues and on the streets, that they may have glory from men. Assuredly, I say to you, they have the reward. But when you do a charitable deed, do not let your left hand know what your right hand is doing, that your charitable deed may be in secret, and your father, who sees in secret, will himself reward you openly. And then that same chapter continues by talking about praying and fasting and how to do both of those things with the right heart and for God as opposed to for men. And then Jesus says in verse 19, Do not lay up for yourselves treasures on earth where moth and rust destroy and where thieves break in and steal, but lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven where neither moth nor rust destroys and where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. 1 Corinthians 4, 6 continues. Now, these things, brethren, I have figuratively transferred myself and Apollos for your sakes, that you may le learn in us not to think beyond what is written, that none of you may be puffed up on behalf of one against the other. For who makes you differ from another? And what do you have that you did not receive? Now, if you did indeed receive it, why do you boast of it? as if you had not received it. Why do you boast as if you had not received it? Now this is going to come as a surprise to many, many people here and, and watching on the internet. But there are people who are not related to me, so they don't actually have to say this, but they tell me that I sometimes do a good job, or they sometimes tell me, I shouldn't say that they, they tell me sometimes, that, they, that I do a good job with these devotionals. And I... I appreciate that. And if that's the case, then that's because of God. And I made a short list of what God would have had to do in my life in order to allow me to really even be here, let alone occasionally do a decent job. <laughs> um, so he saved me. I had nothing to do with that. He gave me the ability to read. There's people who can't, that, that even can't learn to read. Um, he gave me an ability to understand what I read which is, is nice. I have pretty high reading comprehension. Again, I'm having a little bit of trouble with, with 1 Corinthians. I thought Romans and Hebrews were going to be tough, and I mean, I, I'm sure I didn't give you every bit of information. There's stuff that I didn't give, but when I was reading it, I understood it pretty easily. Um, not so with Corinthians. God uh, sent me to preachers, or sent preachers to me that taught from the Bible, so I have a foundation and a background of pretty much my whole life of learning in churches from some fairly good preachers. Um, he gave me parents that taught me the Bible. We did Bible study pretty much every night. And they took me to church uh, pretty much every Sunday, at least once a Sunday, and sometimes on Wednesday, and sometimes Sunday night. 
And at the time, I don't think I approved or appreciated it all that much, but again, I learned a lot from it. Um, he gave me a memory to, to remember verses, and I don't really remember. I, we had this one pastor one time, and I, I'm, if I'm jealous of, I, I, the word jealous is never good, but I'm really jealous of him because you could say something like, um, <laughs> there was this one king that was going to die, and then he rolled, against, he rolled over to face the wall, and he prayed, and he would be like, oh, you're talking about Hezekiah, and that was in uh, chapter 3 or 4, for, and, you know, or sometimes he would get down to the verse, but with these real, real out-of-the-way uh, references, he would go, yeah, I can't remember which chapter that's in, and I'm thinking, that's tough, you know, but this guy, just the memory that he had. Well, I can kind of remember when I'm reading the, when I'm reading through Corinthians, I think a lot about Matthew. I think about what Jesus said about what Paul is saying. And then I type into the internet, which God made some really smart people invent. Uh, Al Gore, you know. Um, <laughs> they invented it so that I can access this information that you used to have to actually go through your Bible and find, or you could have a concordance and find it. And uh, then there's a search engine that uh, uh, certain company created that is pretty good at taking my sort of half-formed phrases with no punctuation and turns it into a verse that I can find. Um, and then it goes on from there. And I think I could, I could probably go on for quite a while saying all the things that God gave me to allow me to come up here and speak. I'm also not really um, afraid. Part of it is because I know all of you somewhat. But, you know, like when there's visitors, I get, I get like a little pitter-patter. But, it, I mean, it used to be a lot worse, and it doesn't, you, you people don't bother me. <laughs> um, and uh, so all of that comes from God. So I hope that I do a good job, and I hope that people learn from it. And I think that if, if you learn from it, you probably, the Holy Spirit is, is doing a lot more than I am about it. But all of that stuff came from God, and I... I I, I work in a, um, I was going to save this for next Sunday, but I, I work in a, I'm an electronics technician, and that is a group of people who really uh, have a good vocabulary, and I can't think of the word. No, they, they um, value, there we go, they value intellect very highly. But intellect, I, I, I think about it, and I'm like, you know, intellect isn't really that big of a deal. I mean, above a certain level, I think, um, you know, it's how, what you do with the things that God gave you is what's really important. And, um, and I say that because I don't have much of an intellect. Yeah. <laughs> uh, that's the joke. So anyways, uh, an intellect is something that God gave you. There's other people who are really strong. I'm not very strong. There's people that are fantastic ditch diggers, and they do a good job at it. And, um... They do it as to the Lord and not as to men. And, and I think that is something that it's hard to keep in mind because I do. I value my intellect. I, I value um, those things and sometimes act like there's something that I did, that it all came from God. Um, Back to 1 Corinthians, now we're on verse 8. You are already full, you are already rich. You have reigned as kings without us, and indeed I wish you did reign, that we might also reign with you. Uh, this is another verse that I have, I have a hard time uh, understanding. All of the commentaries that I found say that this is sarcasm, and that Paul is saying that the Corinthian church is acting like it has attained perfection, and the apostles don't have that illusion. So as they... They stand around and argue about um, out-of-the-way doctrine, and Paul is still preaching just the gospel. Um, he's saying, well, you've already got it all figured out. Verse 9, For I think that God has displayed us, the apostles, last as men condemned to death. For we have been made a spectacle to the world, both to angels and to men. We are fools for Christ's sake, but you are wise in Christ. We are weak, but you are strong. You are distinguished, but we are dishonored. Now, another possibility that came to my mind is that maybe Paul, I mean, it's pretty clear it is sarcasm, but 
I understand sarcasm pretty well, but um, usually you're saying something behind, you know, it's the thing that you're saying when you're saying the sarcasm that, that I don't see coming through to me. And like I say, the commentary seem to take it very literally um, that he's just kind of badgering them over this. But another possibility that I thought of is maybe he's saying that he's going into these new areas and he's being treated as a fool. Remember he said the gospel is foolishness to the world. He's going out to the world and he's meeting skepticism and he's meeting hostility and he's being beaten. And uh, we'll go into that in more detail later. Um, well, back in Corinth, these people are surrounded by other Christians and they are living in, in Corinth. So they also have all kinds of horrible evil stuff around them. But when they're in church, and I think this is something that I've experienced, is when you're in church and you're standing around arguing about who's important or who's the most holy person, it's pretty easy when Paul is being beaten with sticks for, for preaching the gospel and then they're back in their church and they're safe and warm and not being beaten and shipwrecked. And so they, they can stand around and um, almost like the Pharisees that Jesus was talking about in, in uh, Matthew 6, I think it was, they're standing there with, you know, the, like the turn of the century politician talking about all this deep religious stuff. There's a possibility that that's kind of what he was getting at. Verse 11, to the present hour we both hunger and thirst, and we are poorly clothed and beaten and homeless. Then we labor, working with our own hands, being reviled we bless, being persecuted we endure, being defamed we entreat. We have been made as the filth of the world and the offscourging of all things until now. So back to literal, because uh, 2 Corinthians 11.24 goes into more detail about what he's talking about. He gives an account of what he can remember of the horrible things that happened to him. He says, from the Jews, five times I received 40 stripes minus one. Three times I was beaten with rods. Once I was stoned. Three times I was shipwrecked. A night and a day I have been in the deep. In journeys often, in perils of waters, in perils of robbers, in perils of my own countrymen. In perils of the Gentiles, in perils of the city, in perils in the wilderness, in perils in the sea, in perils among false brethren, in weariness and toil, in sleeplessness often, in hunger and thirst, in fastings often, in cold and nakedness, besides the other things, what comes upon me daily? My deep concern for all the churches. So now we're back to speaking literally. Verse 14, I did not write these things to shame you, but as my beloved children, I warn you. For though you might have 10,000 instructors in Christ, yet you do not have many fathers. For in Christ Jesus, I have begotten you through the gospel. Therefore, I urge you, imitate me. For this reason, I have sent Timothy to you, who is my beloved and faithful son in the faith, in the Lord, who will remind you of my ways in Christ as I teach everywhere in every church. Now, some are puffed up as though I were not coming to you. The Corinthian church had some problems. It's, it's actually kind of good to see because um, I think our churches have problems. But in addition to these divisions, in addition to saying who they followed and arguing over who was better, it seems that some people were talking big behind Paul's back. They may have been saying that he did things. He's not so great because, look, he did this and he did that. Um, or just just talking about their own importance. And um, that's not even mentioning the specific sins that were being overlooked in the church that Paul goes and spends a couple of chapters in the, later in the book talking about. And he continues in verse 19, but I will come to you shortly if the Lord wills, and I will know not the word of those who are puffed up, but the power. For the kingdom of God is not in word, but in power. What do you want? Shall I come to you with a rod or in love and a spirit of gentleness? So this is a different kind of preacher. I'm pretty sure that um, a lot of the Corinthians, and I know a lot, of, a lot of modern Christians, want that kind of preacher that tells them that Jesus is love, and Jesus loves, God is love, Jesus loves them, and they're not under the law anymore, and God forgives them. And Paul is saying here, it seems that um, if you're living like you should, and if the church is running smoothly and there's not a lot of divisions in the church, and if they don't give his, his son Timothy a lot of trouble, like don't mess with him, 
<laughs> when he gets to you. Uh, then yeah, he'll show up and he'll give them that that kind of a message, but it's a no. And I would not have that. That's the end of First Corinthians four. Heavenly Father, I thank you again for this opportunity to learn about you and to learn about the early church and how they had the, they had similar problems to what all of our churches still have. And we ask that you would give us unity and um, that you would give us unity as a church and then as individuals that you would give us um, a knowledge that everything that we have comes from you and that we would remember that we're going to be judged for what we do with those things, with the time that you've given us and the money that you've given us and the skill sets that you've given us. And I ask that every one of us would someday be greeted by you and that you would be able to say to us, well done, good and faithful servant. In Jesus' name we pray.